Tonight, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ohlone and Coast Miwok people who inhabited Bay Area lands for 10,000 years. I'm Greg Dalton, and this is Climate One, changing the conversation about energy, economy, and environment. Many climate conversations talk about impacts on future generations, and all too often, young people are not at the table or in the room. Today, we're pleased to have teens and other young people on the Climate One stage and in the audience, so thank you all for coming. Isha Clark is a high school student and activist in Oakland, California. Sarah Goody is a 14-year-old student who has organized a climate strike in San Francisco. Please welcome them to Climate One. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for being here, and thanks for your leadership and your courage. Um, Isha Clark, you spoke at a rally outside Senator Feinstein's office, so take us to that place, that moment, outside the senator's office. What did it look like? Who was there? And then what happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. I showed up to, I was asked to speak at a Sunrise Movement rally outside of Senator Feinstein's office. There was a crowd of about 100 people, um, very lively, very passionate, and I spoke, and it was great. And um, there were some kids, or youth activists, excuse me, from <laughs> Bay Area, very important, from <laughs> Bay Area Earth Guardians crew who wanted to present a letter that they had written to Senator Feinstein. And they invited all the young people who were there to go up and present the letter. And just for some reason, she happened to be in her San Francisco office that day. And they invited us up after some pushback and here you have the renowned Senator Feinstein interaction. <laughs> well, let's, let's go to that. In early 2019, yeah, a group of middle and high school students had this testy exchange in her office. The students asked her to support the Green New Deal resolution. Sunrise Movement posted the video online. It was viewed 10 million times and generated wide media coverage in the New York Times and elsewhere. Here's Senator Feinstein in that video talking about her climate proposal, and she's challenged by a high school student. I will give you a copy of what we do support, and you can take a look at it, and if you've got a problem with it, you can let me know. But I think it has a much better chance of passing than what this is because there is no way to pay for it when it gets done, so nothing will happen. So you, you be the judge, you take a look at it, we're gonna but get we your But we have come copy. to a point where our earth is dying, literally, and it is gonna be a pricey and ambitious plan that is needed to deal with the magnitude of that issue. And so we're here asking you to vote yes on the resolution for the Green New Deal because that is the only thing that That resolution that will not pass the Senate. And you can take that back to whoever sent you here. Why do you and tell her here? Because it doesn't have a single Republican vote. And the Republicans control the United States Senate. Mr. Clark. Um, Senator Feinstein issued a tweet, a statement thereafter, saying, I want the children from the Sunrise Movement to know they were heard loud and clear. I've been and remain committed to doing everything I can to enact real, meaningful climate change legislation. So, Isha Clark, tell us what it was like to go stand there toe-to-toe -to -toe with a <laughs> political legend in California. Um, you know, it's actually funny because in that tweet, she accidentally called them the Sunshine Movement and then deleted the tweet and reposted it with the correct name. Um, so, <laughs> uh, what was it like? It was, you know, I think for me, it was less about the actual interaction and what happened after that, than what happened after that. Um, there was, I felt, accountability to what just happened, and for me, as a young person, as a person of color, I'm kind of used to people talking to me like that. Let's just be real. And so when I was in that interaction, I didn't really recognize how disturbing it was until I saw that the video hit 10 million views on Twitter and was all over CNN and all over the news. Um, and for me, it was really powerful to 
have my voice become such an important weight in politics and media. And, you know, I think the conversation now isn't really about Senator Feinstein anymore. And it's really about politicians in general and power holders in general who aren't and haven't been taking the necessary steps to reverse this climate crisis. You've also said uh, that Senator Feinstein learned and gained respect that, you know, do you think that she, you know, what was the basis for that? When we talked on the phone, you said you thought that she learned and she perhaps gained some respect for you. How do you think it affected her? You know, I hope that all of that is true. And, the, you know, the reality is that we, I don't really know how she how she responded to the interaction and I would love to have a conversation with her if she's willing about next steps to um, proceed in a more productive manner. Um, I hope that in watching the reaction of that interaction, <laughs> she, uh, like you said, learned from it and realized the power of her voice, especially to young people, to the future generations, and though she's been an extremely powerful force in American politics, that there's still things that she could have done that she didn't. Or, you know, and that goes for her peers as well. And so I think that conversation needs to be had about holding our politicians, even who were powerful people, accountable because there's always something more that can be done. And how did this sudden fame affect you? You were on uh, Amy Goodman, which is like, wow. You know, how, yeah. did, that, you know, how, did, the, how did this being suddenly, I mean, you're, you're a junior in high school being yeah. thrust into this national spotlight, spotlight. What was that like? It was crazy. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I mean, I know I'm dope. I love myself. And I like, it was dope. Thank you. It was really cool to be on, to talk, have Amy Goodman in my earpiece. That was crazy. And, you know, getting all of this attention. And that was really cool. And, you know, I just, I'm just a kid from Oakland. And now I'm like on national news. And some people know who my name is and are like listing it next to AOC. Like, that's crazy. But I, I think that for me, what was important from that wasn't my fame, but my new platform and like that I can actually use my voice in a way that is impacting people who can make real policy change, can make the change that I've been wanting for so long. And so I just feel grateful to be able to have or to have had and hopefully continue to have the spotlight to have my voice heard in a way that's really impactful and meaningful. You, you say that um Respect is very important to you. You take it to every place you go, and yet there you were kind of interrupting a, a, a senator. You know, how do you challenge power <laughs> by being respectful? Mm -hmm. Is there a contradiction? Can you do both? You know, I think that truth is respectful, and that you can speak, they, you can speak truth in a way that is compassionate and authentic, and to me, that is respect. And... I was very intentional in, you know, I recognize that she is a well-respected politician. She is an elder in the community and that I was to address her accordingly. But at the same time, I felt a very, I felt a responsibility to tell her the truth and to bring the truth to her. And that if she was going to ignore the truth, that I had to continue to push my voice and to make sure that my voice was being heard in a space that she was trying to bring that down in. Sarah Goody, you had a climate awakening and I think it was in sixth grade. Um, so tell us, <laughs> tell us about that, you know, how you didn't know much about climate, your journey to where you are now to being a regular climate striker. Yeah, so um, I got involved with climate change in sixth grade after um, learning about climate change um, from my sixth grade teacher, Miss Rebecca Newburn. And uh, once I learned about climate change, I was absolutely terrified. I couldn't believe that they had, that the world had been hiding this issue from me for so long. You know, I looked at all my classmates and I thought, how many of them had actually known about this before this had started? 
because truthfully it was almost none. And after that, I started to feel accountable for what was happening. And I really wanted to make a difference. And I did that through eventually joining an organization called Greening Forward, uh, which is empowering youth to um, act for climate change and getting involved. And after that, I was at an event in New York for Greening Forward when I met Alexandria Villasenor, who is a 13-year-old uh, climate striker. She has currently been striking in front of the UN for, I believe, 19 weeks now. And I met her and was completely in awe. You know, she had brought all this attention and power to striking for climate change. And it's part of a movement called Fridays for Future, which was started by a uh, youth activist, Greta Thunberg, in Sweden. And she brought this to the US and really worked and got people involved with it here in the US because, you know, climate change is affecting all of us, not just those who are in Sweden, it's everywhere. So I was really inspired by her and I went home and I started striking um, on my own in San Francisco. I started in front of City Hall and now I am in front of the Ferry Building on every Friday. So yeah. And um, <clears throat> so Sarah Goody, what's that like? You go in front of a, a you know iconic public building. You sit there by yourself. Are you are you, are you by yourself? What's yeah. it like? <laughs> what do people say to you? What's that experience like? Being a 14 year old sitting out there in public, mm -hmm. saying I'm striking for climate. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit daunting, I would say. <laughs> um, you know, people are definitely giving you stares, you know, why aren't you in school? You shouldn't be doing that. You know, I've had people come up to me, climate change isn't real, go home, like, go to school, you should be in school. But no, you know, why study for a future that's not going to exist? You know, I need to be here now and fighting now for my future. And um, I really just have to focus on the positive and focus on those people who do come up to me and are really like, wow, like, I am, I am so glad. And it's knowing that those people do exist, that do um, believe in climate change and do stand up for what's right. And it's, um, it's really empowering to meet those people because I, I feel fulfilled and like I'm doing what I need to be doing. What do your parents think about skipping school? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that <laughs> uh, at, at first they were kind of skeptical, but um, you know, as a good student, I think they're really supportive of me and my passions, and they really believe that I'm doing this for the right cause, and that by doing this, I'm standing up for not just myself, but for my generation as well as future generations for what needs to be taken into account now. And they've been really supportive this whole time. And uh, yeah, they're awesome. Isha Clark, you had a dream of being a surgeon. You've always loved medicine. And I can attest that you have the <laughs> skills because just before we were about to come on, uh, Sarah got a nosebleed backstage <laughs> and Isha was right there taking care of her. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you, know, you, were right, you were right there, you know, drink water, tilt your head back, the whole thing. So... Um, you still think you're going to be on that surgeon path, or has this experience changed that in some way? Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I used to obsess over the future and what I was going to do, and like, I don't know, but I've recently been allowing myself to step back from that and to really focus on keeping my options open, and I think that there's a way for everyone to be, or hopefully there should be a way for everyone to um, combine everything that they love doing, that they're passionate about. I love medicine. I love uh, politics in some ways. I love like activism. I love art. I don't know. I want to find a way to be able to combine everything if that's possible. Well, physicians are some of the most trusted people in the country, more trusted than politicians, yeah. for sure. <laughs> and physicians for social responsibility. A lot of movements have been led by physicians. Certainly the anti-nuclear movement of the 80s, physicians played a very important role. So there's a lot of precedent for that. Mm -hmm. Sarah, when you look out and say, when you're, you know, a long time from now, when you're 30, what, you know, what is your... Um, what does your life look like? What do you think that, what is the world, what do you, do you picture that, you know? Do you think you'll be a mom? 
Yeah, um, so something besides uh, climate change and activism that really speaks out to me is animals. Um, I'm vegan. I went vegan because of the effects that animal agriculture industry has on climate change and human impact. And um, I love animals. Being around them is like my favorite thing ever. And I also really, you know, want to do something with activism and making a difference because I know I won't be happy unless I'm doing something for a greater cause. And um, so, yeah, I want to definitely combine those passions. If you're just joining us, we're talking at Climate One with Isha Clark, a high school student and activist in Oakland, California, and Sarah Goody, a 14-year-old student and climate striker. I'm Greg Dalton. Um, Isha Clark, how has this affected your voice and your identity, this experience? Mm, That is a great question. Um, I feel like I have become so much stronger and more grounded in who I am. And I feel like I've started developing more of the courage to be who that is in every space. You know, in a lot of spaces, it's hard for a little black girl with her fist up to come in screaming. And so I've had to really be okay with that and know that that is an important voice in the room. And so through exercising that and having to practice how to do that, how to articulate myself while still being authentic and truthful um, has definitely lifted me. Sarah Goody, how about your identity and your voice through this experience? You're doing something very lonely. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, um, really, I think activism and being involved in climate change has really led me to find myself and my passions and what I want to do with my life. Um, You know, climate change and this activism, it's led me to be a stronger person and to really feel like I can stand up for what I believe in. And I can now, you know, talk to people about these issues. I can talk to people about what I really care about. And I feel like by doing this, I have really, um, you know, made a dent in myself and really found who I am and found what my purpose in life is. Do you talk about climate, uh, Sarah Goody, uh, at school, or do you feel like you're kind of, you know, you said to me earlier, you don't have a lot of friends at school. You know, do you you find it hard to talk to regular (laughs) teenagers about the, you know, the climate situation. Yeah, well, I've always been told I'm like a very uh, wise beyond my age and (laughs) very mature. So, you know, um, when I see these people, I see them kind of as a younger version of myself, someone who's not really as mature, someone who doesn't have the same skills and knowledge that I do. So it's definitely um, harder to talk to someone about climate change when what they want to talk about is like TikTok videos or, you know, what's the newest thing happening on Snapchat, you know? Um, So it's definitely harder to bring those conversations in, especially when I do, I usually get made fun of or I get, um, you know, people don't want to talk about those things because they don't want to feel guilty. Um, But luckily, I have a science teacher at my school who I feel real... I can always trust and talk to who has, you know, the same beliefs and ideals that I do. And that has really been what has grounded me throughout this experience is knowing that I have, you know, an ally and a mentor that I can trust and uh, confide in. Isha Clark, how has your peer group responded? Do you talk to them about climate? I mean, now, um, do they think it's relevant to them? You know, I think that a lot of young people have the potential to get involved in this movement and have the the skills and the drive to be able to do that and don't have the resources to be able to get involved. And so I think that, yes, to answer your question, at school, I try to, when I'm not doing homework or <laughs> the million other things I'm doing at school, I try to talk to my friends and my peers and get them to come out to the events that I'm planning with Youth Versus Apocalypse. And some of them do show, and I think a lot of them are getting excited about this movement that at times can be very depressing. So I think there's so much potential in young people, even in the ones who are ignoring and (laughs) wanting to do TikTok videos. I think there's, they just have to be reached a little bit harder. When you say it's depressing, what do you do in those dark days? Because it it's, uh, can be pretty anxiety-provoking. Mm-hmm. When you look at the science, 
It's scary. What do you what do you do with that when you're so? I mean, adults have problems with that. Um, <laughs> how do you deal with that when you're a teenager and you got so many other anxieties and and dark? How do you deal with that, Isha? Um, honestly, I go in my room and I light some sage and I read a book. <laughs> but um, on a serious note, I do no, do that. But on that's real. but on that's another real. note, <laughs> don't dismiss on that. A more, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. It really works. On a more um, general note, I should say, I think I always tell people that our task is to fuel our fear into fire and into passion and determination. And I tell myself every day that there's no other option but to win this fight. And if you really make yourself believe that, I truly believe that what you put out into the world will manifest. And so I continue to just say that mantra and it will come true. Wow. <laughs> Sarah Goody, how do you deal with the anxiety or fear, knowing what you know, being climate conscious at such a young age? Yeah, um, it's definitely a lot, you know, uh, knowing that this will lead, if not acted upon now, to the end of humanity and our society. It, it's a lot, <laughs> um, but I think the way to cope with it is... Uh, truly by acting, I find that a really great way to cope with it because I know that I'm, I'm doing my part and I feel at least um, some sort of responsibility to do something. So when I am doing something, I feel like I'm finally, you know, like there is hope. So that's definitely one way I cope with it. But um, more of what Yisha said with her sage, um, I definitely, I think an escape for me is I love to dance and I love to do theater. So it's finding those outside uh, things to do because even though we are so devoted to this cause, we also need a little bit of, you know, brightness and relief in our life as well. Yeah, it can consume you. Um, I interviewed Bill McKibben a few years ago who said, look, you know, this is, we talk about climate and science and all these things. This is about power. This, you know, the, the climate argument was won in the 80s and the 90s. This is really about power. So Sarah's from a wealthy community. Mm -hmm. Isha is from a not wealthy community. And I want to talk about wealth and power and whether that needs to be addressed as part of climate, Isha. Oh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> you know, I, I completely agree. It is the entire fight. Um, you know, I, yeah, I just, so many thoughts. Um, climate change is an absolute fact, and it has been for decades. And at this point, it's about changing this mystical connotation that comes with talking about climate change and politics and really changing it to something that is serious and that needs to be taken seriously. We have the presidential elections coming up right now and we need to make it clear that you have to take us not only addressing that climate change is real and man-made. That's not enough anymore. You have to talk about what solutions you are planning to implement because at this point, we have no time to waste. We know climate change is real. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. Sarah, what do you think, you know, your community, people are very privileged, mostly white, you know, do they feel, are they aware of climate change? Do you think that climate change can be addressed without unsettling and changing some of the privilege and wealth in that community? Yeah, I think uh, privilege definitely plays a part in, you know, climate change and how, you know, those who are going to be most affected by climate change are going to be less privileged. Um, and I think definitely in a more privileged or wealthy community, it's um, definitely, I think, lower on the spectrum of what people are aware of. I think people are definitely more interested in their own lives. And I think that's a part of kind of our mantra as a uh you know, country that we're striving for, you know, money or to be the best at something or, you know, to have the most power when really it should be, you know, how are we going to make uh, a society that's the best place for everyone to live in? And I definitely think that with climate change, at least it's it's not being addressed enough, as Isha said, and it's definitely um, something that's they're they're not acting. Uh, politicians need to act now. It, it's it's not something that we can wait till you know 2050 as <laughs> Diane Diane yeah. Feinstein. Yeah, <laughs> she, yeah, no, no. It's it's been proven. <laughs> it's it's been proven. Scientists, we have to trust these people. I mean, they they say we have till 2030. We we can't prolong that. 
we can't make um make false claims and yeah if I may add, sorry, I'm just also thinking in this conversation about power and climate change, there also needs to be, um, it needs to be addressed that this climate crisis is so rooted in white supremacy and racism and econo economic exploitation and greed and so many other things that I can list. And that needs to be recognized in the movement to change it. We can't just talk about you know, saving the rainforest or the polar bears, like that is so important, but we at this point have to talk about how climate change is becoming so much of a detriment to communities of color and low income communities mm -hmm. who don't have the resources to be able to fight climate change in the way that other communities are. And so if we are really saying that we want to save the world, we want to reverse climate change, we have to not only partner, but allow the movement to be led by the people who are most impacted by the issue. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's what the Green New Deal recognizes and addresses, and that's partly why it's so uh, challenging to a lot of environmentalists uh, and people like Senator Feinstein who, who get a little uncomfortable with that, that challenging the, those deeper those deeper issues. Um, I wanted to, to look at you know a, a youth activist, a little who um, has gone on. So we're going to talk about a ten-year-old Sager uh, Arial, who is organizing in his home country of Nepal. Eventually, helped him make connections with other young people across the globe. Arial now works with Plant for the Planet Initiative, a tree planting organization founded by a nine-year-old from Germany. We spoke to Ariel about his life path and how he's accomplished so much before the ripe old age of 23. I'd never imagined that Mount Everest, the tallest mountain of the world, would lose its snow. And that's something very troublesome for people who live in the foothills of Himalayas because the mountains, it balances climate, provides fresh water and tourism business for Nepal's economy. And when I came to hear about the fact that the overproduction of greenhouse gases, the rise in temperature, actually created havoc in climate crisis, I wanted to do something. I was uh, 10 years old when I first started a nonprofit initiative in Nepal. My peers supported me. We started a readers club. We wanted to read about these issues. We wanted to know what's going on. And just when we started in about two, three weeks, we had more than 3,000 books collected for us to read. In 2010, I was in a children's conference in Norway and I met a lot of other young people who were doing similar things. And there I heard about Plant for the Planet was um, founded by a nine years old kid and a bunch of other teenagers who were leading it. I felt that I was not alone trying to change the world or trying to change the climate crisis in a way because there I came to see that there are many, many other more children who have similar visions for the world and I wanted to be part of it. When I joined Plant for the Planet, the goal was to plant a million trees and now our goal is actually to plant a trillion trees around the world. It's very important that young people today should not rely on political promises and depend for others to change the world because we have seen recent events like Brexit where if only all the young people had taken part, the outcomes would have been different. That was Sager Ariel, chair of the board of Plant for the Planet. So. Uh, Isha and Sarah, your reaction to seeing someone like that, mm. that story? The scale, the ambition, the international, the international connectedness of it, a trillion trees, I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. It's, okay. <laughs> um, it's very powerful. And you know, I think there needs to be a mix of people fighting for what we're calling the movement and people who are implementing tangible things, you know, um, and they're both equally important and impactful. And so to see someone take on planting a trillion trees, that's incredible. Um, and I love trees. I love oxygen. I love seeing <laughs> <Yeah>. green. <laughs> so all power to them. <laughs> yeah. Sarah Goody. 
Yeah, no, definitely. It's um, amazing to see that not only is it, you know, you know, a lot of people tend to think of the U.S. or places where it's really apparent that uh, people are acting up for climate change, but, you know, in other places, uh, I believe he was in Nepal. Nepal. Yeah, mm-hmm. Nepal. You know, it's great to see that other places are getting involved because it's not just... Um, a problem facing one country. It's a problem facing the world mm-hmm. and humanity as a whole. It's not just a group of people or a special, um, you know, g- group. It's it's everyone. And the fact that he is, you know, taking the initiative and starting his own thing, you know, planting a trillion trees is a lot. <laughs> but um, I think that's definitely showing uh, the power of youth and how we really have this undisturbed passion. You know, it's not swayed by money or greed or... Uh, work or anything it's 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 really true passion that comes from within us and it really shows you know through things you know Isha's up here I'm up here I have so many friends who and it seems as though this movement is really being led by youth and that's another great example of how we have time for a couple of questions and we're going to do something unusual if you are under 20 and you have a question for these two. This is your, you know, your moment, your opportunity. Uh, so as a special encouragement, don't be shy. The first one, we have a couple of, of opportunities here. Otherwise, we're tight on time. If, if no one's bold and goes, we have two courageous leaders. Surely someone could be <laughs> courageous and go to the microphone uh, and ask a question of them. Going once. I think there's one in the front. Oh, sorry. Oh, can you please go? Sorry, the, the microphone's in the back. Yeah, please go to the microphone in the back, and we'll adjust it for you. Yep. Perfect. Three. We'll get these three. If you're three of you are going, uh, we'll get them quickly, and then we'll move to our second segment. Let's go to audience questions. Could please state your name and your age, and then um, put your question. Um, hi, I'm Eris, and I am 11 years old. And I was wondering if you ever felt that you lost respect because of your age. Hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. Isha Clark. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Uh, You know, there's just this culture in our country, but also in our world of belittling people who have less life experience. Um, And, you know, our message is seen as not as important or as educated because we haven't reach the age where we can go get our fancy degrees or have our work experience to put on our resumes. And so our message isn't as important to them. And so there's definitely instances where I have been belittled or disrespected because of my age, i.e. the Senator Feinstein reaction. (laughs) That was definitely one. Um, But also in daily life. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah Goody. I can definitely agree with that. Uh, as a youth, it's definitely hard. Yeah. Next question. Welcome. Um, I'm Emmett Price, and I'm 11. Um, and I was wondering, like, how did you find the encouragement and like time and power to stand up and let your voice be heard? Mm. Yeah, Sarah Goody? Yeah, so um definitely it's it, it's it's not a small um commitment. It's it's something but it is you you're gonna have time if you're really that passionate about it. And if you really believe that it's something important to you and you really have that that drive for it, I think it's definitely something you can make time for. And there, you know, you think of all the time you may spend watching T V or, you know, I don't know, playing Fortnite, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> whatever people do, I don't know, you know, they, you could be using that time so well to do so many things that could really benefit our earth and our planet, and um, I kind of forget one, well, yeah. <laughs> go, go to our last question, welcome. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Keon, I'm 17. Um, I, I mean, I'd like to speak maybe to like some of what Isha was talking about before, like, um, basically like could you speak more to like the ways of building like solidarity with sort of groups advocating for other causes and sort of creating sort of broad-based movements and like kind of you know speak more to the idea of like you know addressing that that the climate change is like a you know an issue of like racism and rooted in colonization and you know how, how do you um 
you know, ways you've gone about sort of empowering you know, the groups that are most affected to be at the forefront and also to, you know, unite it with other causes? Mm. Um, I think that we have to be comfortable in being uncomfortable. That's as simple as it is, you know? I mean, it's definitely a much harder task than it is said out loud, but really, as a white person, being able to listen, not to respond, but to understand when a person of color or a minority group is telling you a way that they feel silenced or unwelcome, we know that it's not always intentional, but we have to address it or else it will continue to happen because oftentimes it's not intentional disrespect or hatred, it's just ignorance and not having to think about race every single day of your life, not having to think about gender or age every single day of your life. So being able to sit in uncomfort, in uncomfort and really taking on the responsibility of stepping back and of allowing voices that you know are more impacted to speak and to be in the front. Some years ago, there was a woman named Abigail Bora who uh, went to a UN climate conference and she stood up and she shouted down Todd Stern, who was the then US climate negotiator. Uh, she went on Aiming Goodman uh, <laughs> and then she came on Climate One and uh, I think her parents only heard about the thing on NPR. They're, what are you doing shouting at that diplomat? <laughs> uh, um, and I lost track of her, but I hope that we won't lose track of you too because I really hope that you know in a couple of years you'll come back, keep in touch with us because I'm really curious where your arc's gonna go. I think you're gonna be going places in this movement. So. Uh, we've been talking about two teenage climate activists about school strikes and the fierce urgency of now. Isha Clark is a high school student in Oakland, California. Sarah Goody is a 14-year-old student near San Francisco. Thank you for your courage and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we welcome up our next panel, we have a special treat for you. Um, Stephen, you sure you can sit in uh, Monica's seat there. Um, Stephen Schneider was a founder of Modern Climate Science, along with Jim Hansen and a handful of others. In 2009, Steve came to Climate One to launch his book, Cli Science as a Contact Sport, Inside the Battle to Save Earth's Climate. After presenting the political battles over climate science, Steve asked, what can a regular person do? He referred readers to the Crosby, Stills, and Nash song, Teach Your Children. The next year, Steve died on an airplane on his way home to San Francisco. He was planning to come to Climate One after he landed at SFO. After that tragedy, Teach Your Children became a theme song for Climate One. Singer-songwriter Monica Maria Fimbres has performed the song for us on several occasions, and I'm delighted to welcome her back to Climate One. Monica Maria Fimbres. Well, since I do have the mic for one moment, I just want to say before I play that I am just so in awe and so grateful to be here and a part of this and to just hear these youth speak. It's very beautiful and inspiring. So thank you. children 
children well Their father's hell It slowly go by And feed them on your dreams The ones they miss The ones you'll know by Don't you ever ask them why if they told you, you would cry So just look at them and sigh And know they love you And you of tender Your parents well, their children's hell will slowly go by and feed them on your dreams, the ones they picked, the ones they'll know by. Don't you ever ask them why, if they told you so just look at them and sigh And know they love you And know they love you Fabulous, thank you, Monica. One of the highlights of Climate One was um, 2013, I had the honor of interviewing Graham Nash and we brought up a bunch of children who then sang that song uh, to him. It was the first time it had ever been done that children had sang the Graham Nash's own song to him. So we're gonna add one more chair up here and then we're gonna invite our next panel up. Um, three people working with and on behalf of young people who will be dramatically impacted by climate. Just pretend you're watching a Viagra commercial or something. Yeah. <laughs> We're joined now by three people working with and on behalf of young people who've been dramatically impacted by climate, destabilized by their parents and other old people. Julie Olson is executive director of our Children's Trust and chief legal counsel for plaintiffs in Juliana versus the United States. Come on up, Julie. Yeah, come on up. Yep. And Marissa Zuckerman is Bay Area chapter coordinator of the Sunrise Movement. Marissa. And Ben Wessel is a youth vote director at Next Gen America. Welcome to, uh, welcome to all of you. Um, wow, qu quite a tough act to follow there. <laughs> um, Marissa Zuckerman, let's begin with you. You know, uh, Sunrise Movement is behind the, new, uh, the Green New Deal. It's kind of the grassroots part of it. It's not the policy part of it. But um, what is the Green New Deal? We heard in that uh, part of that video with Senator Feinstein that we didn't play was debate whether it was really something to be passed or was it something to get aspirations and people talking? Which is it? Great question. Uh, I guess first I'll say that the Green New Deal is not actually a policy yet. It is a vision 
uh, a very bold one of what it would look like to transform every sector of our economy and society in order to take on climate change at the scale and level that both science and justice demand. So it is, uh, as of now, just um, a vision of what that, po what that policy could look like or what that set of policies um, could become over the next two years. And that's part of what Sunrise is doing, um, is helping to support a movement of young people to make this an urgent political priority um, so that the Green New Deal can become law. And uh, we recently had Carlos Curbelo, who is a Republican, former Republican member of Congress, represents the southern tip of Florida that's, yeah, um, <laughs> with us for a while. Um, and he said that the Green New Deal has got people talking. He doesn't agree with it, but has certainly opened up the conversation and gotten people talking. Uh, Julie Ols Olson, your case has been uh, in the courts for some number of years. I think I did my first interview about it back in 2011. It, it goes way back. What is the b basic legal argument of Juliana versus the United States, and what are you trying to accomplish? So 21 young people have sued the federal government for violating their fundamental rights under the Fifth Amendment to life, liberty, and property. And for the first time ever, a federal judge has recognized that we all, all these young people, have a right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life under the US Constitution. So we're about to go up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to argue and, and try to hold on to that really solid ruling so we can go to trial. So, um, <clears throat> Michael Gerard is an expert at the Columbia Law School, runs the Climate Law Center there. He says he's surprised that uh, this case has gotten that far. He also says that the courts rarely declare new rights and that the Supreme Court has made it clear in American Power versus Connecticut that EPA sets pollution standards, not the courts. So it seems like you're in kind of a branch of government issue here that people might agree with you, but it's really EPA that should do this, not the courts. What do you say to that? Well, we fully agree that EPA should set standards that protect your, your life. <laughs> so we, we don't disagree uh, with that. Uh, this case is different. It's a constitutional case. It's about civil rights, not uh, environmental statutory law. And what the case really says is that for over 50 years, we have evidence that your government has known that if they continue to promote a fossil fuel energy system, that it would cause the climate emergency that we have today. And with that knowledge, they continued to create policies and plans and promote and subsidize the fossil fuel energy system that we are all locked into. And that is an infringement of, of the young plaintiffs in this case, fundamental rights to life and personal security and family autonomy and all of the things that we depend upon for our well-being and our safety. So there's been lots of legal maneuvering with this under President Obama, certainly under President Trump. Uh, uh, what happens if you lose at the Ninth Circuit? Is it game over for your suit? No. <laughs> um, so we've, we've been up to the Ninth Circuit several times now, and we have prevailed each time. We're going up on June 4th for an argument that you can all watch on live stream. And... Um, if we were to get an adverse ruling, um, which I, I don't foresee, we could then appeal to the en banc court of the Ninth Circuit. We could also petition the Supreme Court for review. Um, but we're optimistic. The district court judge wrote an excellent decision, several of them actually in our case, and we're in, we have solid evidence. We're on good footing to go forward. But can't this just get bounced to the Supremes and then they'll decide that you know, that's not a friendly territory for this case? You know, I, I disagree with that. I actually think this case is really appeals to not just the liberals on the bench, but it appeals to conservative values. And um, what we're challenging is the abuse of government power. We're fighting for liberty and rights that are foundational to our nation. And actually, the founding fathers, they understood about the importance of the climate system and soil and water to the wealth and prosperity of the nation. And they put in the Constitution that 
they were creating the government in order to protect not just themselves, but posterity, which is future generations. So this is about the enduring value of our constitution and our nation. Talking about youth climate action in, in the courts, at the ballot box, and in the streets, and in classrooms. Uh, ben Wessel, uh, the 2018 midterms marked a 100-year high for voter turnout. Spiked uh, in 2018, the shift was especially notable among young voters, where 36% uh, of people 18 to 29 cast a ballot, uh, almost 50% people 30 to 44. Um, is this sustainable? Will this kind of sag back down? Tell us the, the significance of it. Well, that. we're doing a lot of work to make sure that the that doesn't happen, Greg. <laughs> um, yeah, we saw record turnout, thanks on behalf to lots of um, activism from folks like the folks in this room. And we saw uh, record youth turnout, like Greg mentioned, the highest uh, turnout rate amongst young people, especially since we lowered the voting age to 18 in 1971. And part of the reason, I think, is a reaction to Donald Trump and the Republicans and their policies that have been put in place to uh, make our lives as young people a little bit more difficult. But it's also a recognition that young people have a lot of power. There are more of us than there are of any other generation. And we're the more most progressive generation that's ever come through uh, American politics. Um, but we turn out at half the rates as older folks. Like, we know that that's true. Um, politicians listen to those who show up. So if we show up, then they'll have to listen to us. And we see young people across the country, whether it's a mayoral race or a presidential race, uh, starting to recognize that truth and organize themselves in order to start changing the people who are in power. And you work for an organization that's funded by, by Tom Steyer, was largely seen as kind of a, you know, a laying the groundwork for his presidential campaign. He said he's not running. So how does that work for you in terms of being fund, so associated by one wealthy person? It's very top down compared to the other organizations we're talking to here, which are not driven by one. Yeah, I can recommend finding one wealthy person and have them fund your <laughs> life's work. It's, uh, I, I feel incredibly lucky that Tom is a, is a, is a gracious benefit factor. Um, but I challenge the idea that it's top down. We're actually incredibly bottom up. Just today I was hanging out with our 10 state directors who work in our 10 states. who are all young people who are organizing in the communities in which they grew up. And it's an incredibly diverse bunch that come to this politics for a bunch of different reasons. Some are, are driven uh, by climate justice. Some are focused on health care. Some are focused on uh, gun violence prevention. And some are looking at the intersection of all those. And one of the things that's incredibly cool about Tom is he recognizes um, that he's not a young person and that he doesn't know what's going to attract young people. And I bet if we asked him what a TikTok video was, he would have zero idea. So instead, uh, we've been very lucky to have a, a, a donor and supporter and true collaborator in this effort who's listening to the voices of young people. And I think we could use more people in our politics who would do the same. So uh, what's the plan then for looking out at 2020? Climate typically has not been you know, a, um, a top issue at the, at the ballot box. Is that changing now? Sure. I mean, I think Marissa and her team at Sunrise have done a phenomenal job of making sure that this Democratic presidential primary is, is uh, talking about climate change in a way that I don't think any of us necessarily expected. Um, and now we've got to run with that momentum. I think one of the things that will be very interesting to see is, uh, is this soft support? So we're seeing polls that say climate change is the number one issue for Democratic primary voters, um, even in Iowa and New Hampshire, not just nationwide. Uh, is this soft support? Or once, once folks start lobbying attacks on the Green New Deal, um, will, will, will the voters stand up and say, no, this is really important to me, and this is how I'll base my decision? Um, I know from all the young people that I'm talking to, and that our team is talking to, uh, that will always ring true. These are young people who are growing up hearing from stories about, honestly, how screwed their future is if we don't take uh, drastic action right now. And one of the things that I'm really in, uh, in awe of is that they are not being discouraged, but rather that fact is making them double down on their commitment to our politics, which is real exciting. Marissa Zuckerman, uh, Beto O'Rourke came out big uh, on climate, and that was his first detailed policy announcement, uh, but he did not say, sign the pledge that he would not take any fossil fuel money, and then Sunrise got into the game. Tell us how that played out. Yeah, so one of the things that Sunrise has been doing alongside other movement allies is calling out the hypocrisy of what it means to be putting forward a plan on climate while simultaneously accepting uh, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of dollars from the industry that is condemning 
my generation's future um, to be unlivable. And any politician who wants to be taken seriously and wants to be seen as legitimate uh, in, in caring about the climate crisis and acting on that scale cannot also be accepting donations from the very same industry. So, um, <laughs> Beto O'Rourke was pressured by Sunrise and eventually signed, is that right? Yes, that's right. And uh, I think you are Sunrise, if I recall correctly, there's a Democratic debate in Detroit at the end of July, and Sunrise is saying that, what do you want to happen? You're, you're putting some pressure and focus on, the, on that debate in July. Yeah, that's right. So. Um, over the past few weeks, Sunrise has been traveling around the country um, and has held a series of over 200 town halls um, with community groups uh, to build support for the Green New Deal, and we've seen incredible turnout. And the next step is the debate at the end of July. Um, and this is really a time to put uh, all candidates' feet to the fire and say, um, yes, it's great that you're maybe taking this pledge and uh, giving soft support. Um, now we're seeing more concrete plans, and we want you to promise publicly that the Green New Deal, that climate action, that action on racial and economic justice will be a day one priority. Uh, we've seen that we're going to have a really narrow window in which we can try to pass the Green New Deal after, hopefully, we regain the White House in 2020. Um, so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a firm public commitment that this will be the defining issue um, of the next presidency because it's the defining issue of our time. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've gone to Ben Wessel. We've really traveled some distance in 08 and uh, Obama and McCain were basically in the same place. It was drill, baby, drill, but they were both for cap and trade. And then we went through a couple elections where climate didn't get mentioned at all. And now we have the candidates kind of duking it out. You know, Beto comes out with five trillion and, and uh, uh, Inslee says nine trillion. And, you know, and then Bi Biden's getting slapped for not being uh, ambitious enough. Um, going back to Obama's not good enough. Uh, ben Wessel, so how's this going to how's this going to play out? Is this going to have staying power through the campaign, or is it going to kind of fade when immigration and healthcare really come forward? I think one of the things that I've learned from the young people that I work with, and that that Marissa and some of the the young activists we heard from earlier. Um, these are not disparate issues, right? This is one intersectional movement that has to address our racial injustices, our climate injustices, and our economic injustices. I actually think the Democratic primary electorate is recognizing that more than ever before. And so, you know, I worked on campaigns in 08 and 10 and 12 where it was like, okay, what are our top three issues that we need to put on the top of our website? Um, that doesn't exist in the same way that it did before. Our politics has changed. And part of that, I I think is the, the growing influence of uh, uh, an electorate that is much younger, especially Democratic electorate that's much younger, that uh, doesn't want to rank issues. But we say all of these are tied for number one, and we need to address all of them using one fundament fundamental solution. And whenever you try to divide us into immigration people, healthcare people, and climate people, um, we'll frankly just sort of laugh in your face because that's not who we are. So the, the, the polls look to say these days that a lot of people care about climate, but Ben Wessel and Australia, there was an election and coal won. Uh, Washington is in one of the most progressive states in the country, liberal state. They rejected a carbon price twice. France, 83% of the people say climate is a, is a threat and they scrapped fuel taxes because people protested. Mm -hmm. So polls and politics, there, it seems like democracies are zigging and zagging on climate, which really raises a question for me about whether you know, there can be enough public support for this or whether it will get to the courts where, or where it needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, I would say the power of a uh, prepared activist populace is one of the best things that we can do now. There's lots of things that we can't control. One of the things we can control is building a broad-based movement that's willing to hold our politicians' feet to the fire. I think one of the things that we have now, as opposed to the last time we attempted to pass climate policy, is we have a real, true movement that's invested in this, uh, rather than just some, some high-paid uh, 
sort of PA or PR folks in DC. Um, and so I am hoping that that will be enough. I also know we don't know what's going to happen. I think if you had had us on this stage this far out of the 2016 election, none of us would have said um, that that President 45 would be in there. So uh, I am looking forward to helping build the movement over the course of the next year and a half to make sure that we can hold um, our elected officials that this happens on day one and that we don't have a situation uh, like they have in France, for example. Julie Olson, uh, in Brown versus Board of Education, uh, tell us where the court was relative to public opinion then and where it is relative to public opinion now. Yeah, so in 1954, only 30% of Americans supported desegregation. And yet the Supreme Court issued a landmark decision that has been critical for our nation. And it came 50 years too late, it came 50 years after Plessy versus Ferguson, which said separate but equal or constitutional. And we don't have 50 years on climate, right? But I think what Brown v. Board and other cases like it tell us is when an issue is not deemed fundamental and when it doesn't have constitutional protection, then the political winds that shift from one administration to the next can change the game. And so what we hope to do through our case in, in lifting up the voice of youth in the judiciary, our third branch of government, is to secure the binding constitutional mandate that forces the people in, in the presidency and in the legislature to actually adopt laws and policies that comply with its constitutional obligation. If we don't have that, then we're still playing the game. And so it's critical that we're working in all three branches of government, and I'm just so excited to see the youth movement putting the pressure on all of the political leaders and being in the streets and everywhere. We need action on all fronts. We're in an, em an emergency. Julie Olson, I vividly remember something you said to me probably five years ago, which is a lot of environmentalism, stop this pipeline, mm. stop this coal terminal is a game of whack-a-mole. You know, you stop this coal terminal in Oakland or Bell Bellingham or wherever, and it just comes up somewhere else. You stop Keystone, it feels like a victory, and the oil goes on trains or somewhere else. So tell us about that, that theory of whack-a-mole and why you think the co courts are, are the answer. Yeah, so I think the, the problem we have, it's a, it's a system of power, and, but it is a system. It's a systemic problem. So when we try to stop the, the piecemeal parts of the system, we're not really addressing the dysfunctional whole. And it's why um, the case, the Juliana case, really challenges that whole fossil fuel energy system. Uh, I found as a litigator that going after one project at a time wasn't getting us to where we needed to go. And we have to go after the whole system, including the economic and racial injustices that we still have in this country. Marissa Zuckerman, uh, when you were, I believe you were still in college in 2014, you engaged in some civil disobedience in Richmond with your mom. Tell us what it was like to, uh, to do that. Yeah, well, I was born and raised in Oakland. And um, when I was in high school, uh, was here um, driving over the Bay Bridge when the uh, Chevron refinery in Richmond um, exploded uh, and sent 15,000 people to the hospital. Um, Richmond uh, has been a community that has been uh, impacted by Chevron um, and other companies like it who have systematically targeted communities of color, low-income communities, um, to place their, their pollution and their extraction and their refining. Um, so uh, as a white person, as a person who does have the option, um, the legal status, to be able to risk arrest, um, it, was, it was an option for me and I chose to do it. Um, and I, I uh, went with my mom and my godmother and Bill McKibben and um, hundreds of other local community activists from Richmond um, and other people from around the Bay Area who uh, sat in in front of the Chevron refinery um, as part of a, a national um, wave of action at refinery sites um, around the country to call attention to the injustices that are happening um, in our backyard that many people um, don't know about or are turning a blind eye to. 
I think an investigation of that fire afterwards found that there was a, a pipe that actually bypassed some monitoring uh, equipment there at that Chevron refinery. I'm not sure if that ever... Um, what came of that. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Julie Olson, Executive Director of our Children's Trust and the Chief Legal Counsel for the Plaintiffs in Juliana versus the United States, and Ben Wessel, Youth Vote Director at Next Gen America, and Marissa Zuckerman, Bay Area Chapter Coordinator for the Sunrise Movement. I'm Greg Dalton. We're going to go to our lightning round and ask um, uh, association. I'm just going to mention something, and Ben Wessel and the others are going to mention the first thing that pops into their mind, unfiltered, with um, reckless abandon. Um, this was so, not advertised. <laughs> uh, ben Wessel, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say the climate plan advanced by Republican elders George Schultz and Jim Baker? Not enough. George Schultz is actually downstairs right now. We can Sorry, go. George. Not enough. <laughs> um, Join uh, us. Uh, Julie Olson, what comes to mind when I say Jerry Brown's climate legacy? Not, <laughs> not enough. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Marissa Zuckerman, cap and trade. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't plan it this way. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> uh, true or false, uh, Ben Wessel, you feel like the token male guest on this program. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, Julia Olson. True or false, you are tired of environmental lawyers opining about constitutional law about which they know very little. True. Uh, Marissa Zuckerman, you wish you had the courage of Isha Clark and Sarah Goody when you were a teenager. So true. <laughs> Seconded. Uh, Julie Olson, true or false, you rejected a settlement offer from the Obama administration that would have established a constitutional right to a stable climate. False. <laughs> uh, ben Wessel, the best thing, true or false, Ben Wessel, the best thing a climate activist can do this election cycle is defeat Republicans where they live. True. Very true. Hat tip to Dave Roberts at Vox for that one. Um, Last one for uh, Ben Wessel, true or false, no young people care what a 60-year-old billionaire from San Francisco has to say. I hope false. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give them a round for thanking, getting through the lightning round. Before we go to audience questions, um, what are some resources, people listening to this, we have the podcast listeners now all over the country, around the world, where can people go if they want to learn about youth engagement, youth learning, where, what are some resources, is it Ben or Marissa? After you. Marissa, where, where can people go to learn? Obviously Sunrise Movement, but where people want to take that next step, learn, where can a young person go to get involved and informed? Well, I would say go to sunrisemovement.org and to, and to any person who's out there who's trying to figure out what it means to get involved right now, I would say don't sit this one out. Uh, we are in the 11th hour and whatever you're wanting to do, find other people to do it with, to find the resources, to find the group. Um, anything that you can do is going to be more powerful and less scary if you're not doing it alone. When Bill McKibben was asked on this stage, what can an, an individual do? He said, don't act like an individual. Link yes. arms uh, with other people. Ben Wessel? Or yeah, I, I, would, I would second that. I would say, um, you know enough already. You don't need some guide to tell you how to do this. The fact young people are the most, currently young people are the most networked uh, generation that we've ever had. If you just go on your Insta story, say, hey, I want to do something about this issue. I guarantee you'll have four or five, six DMs waiting for you to do it with you. I would always encourage you to go to nextgenamerica.org slash volunteer. And the last thing I'll say is the people who you come up with in this movement, are going to be with you this whole time. You told a story briefly about Abigail Bora, um, who is actually a young activist who I had the privilege of training. And uh, now they continue on in the fight. And so the people you start with when you're young, they will impress you for generations to come. And Julie Olson. Yeah, so youthvgov.org, if you want to get involved in the legal movement, um, go there, check it out. There's a lot of ways to get involved. And then Earth Guardians is a fabulous organization. A lot of the youth we work with are, are with Earth Guardians, so check them out too. Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome to Climate One. Thank you. From someone who is young at heart, I want to thank all of you and ask you, what are you saying to Republican-based young people, and what are they saying to you? 
Ben Wessel. Yeah, great question. So one of the things that we have the privilege of doing is working in places like Iowa or Wisconsin or Florida or central Pennsylvania where we do meet a lot of Republican young people. Honestly, the first thing we do is ask them to change their party affiliation. Uh, but, but beyond that, um, we find a lot of young Republicans are with us on the issues and frankly, they oftentimes are Republicans as an artifact of what their parents are. So we're out there encouraging people to educate themselves on the issues and where the candidates um, of both parties stand. And when you take off the partisan labels, we find that those young people are often gravitating towards the more progressive candidates. So I'm incredibly bolstered uh, by the fact that there are so-called Republican young people who are becoming more progressive voters. And we know we can't get everyone. And so um, we stop trying after a certain point. Don't waste your time beating your head against a wall. Next question. Welcome to Climate One. Hi, my name is Peter Gisela, and last week I went to a commission hearings in Washington that's looking at ways to inspire youth to participate in nonprofit work, AmeriCorps programs, or military service. And next year they're going to be issuing the report in March. My question is, last September and last week, I told them about a bill that was in the Congress 40 years ago that proposed to have youth think about civic obligations, civic service between their 17th birthday and 18th. My question is to you, do you see American youth embracing such a challenge to think about civic obligations between 17 and 18 and then participating in something? I think there is a Climate Corps program. Who'd like to, th anyone? You want to take I mean, I think that as young people looking towards a future that is increasingly unstable, um, I see this as a civic duty to be involved, to um, be socially engaged in whatever way I can. And I think that is, this is true also for many of the young people that I work, work alongside. So I think um, that's going to look different for everyone, but um, in whatever way it can, I think we all have to, um, to try to do, to do that work. Next question. Welcome. Uh, my name is Carter Brooks. Uh, so one of the issues that came up in the other panel is uh, how young people get talked down to because they don't understand things that older people understand. Uh, but there are some things that we do learn by age. Um, so uh, I wonder, uh, both for the people that are working with young people that are older and then for the young people, um, what are some of the things you've realized that the older generation is right about, about how hard things are to change or how systemic things uh, need to be framed or addressed or understood without dampening the youthful enthusiasm for shooting for the moon. Julie Olson? Look, I, I just believe in young people, and one of our missions at Our Children's Trust is to uplift and elevate their voices because, I mean, they intuitively know what is right, and a lot of adults lose that. So I think, I think they are the answer, and I would say that... Um, Anything is possible, and that's what youth bring us. Like, when we decided to put someone on the moon, we did that. And when we wanted to mobilize the nation for World War II, we did that. And we stopped building homes and stopped building cars, and we built for the wartime effort. Like, we can mobilize when we want to and need to. And I think the youth are inspiring us as adults. Like, we were talking about Senator Ed Markey and how he's been in this fight for a long time, but he has new life and excitement right now because of the youth from the Sunrise Movement and the youth I work with. Um, so I, I guess I sort of disagree with the premise of your question. But the one thing that we, the one thing that we often find our our older allies can help us with as youth activists is unlocking your networks. Right? We don't get invited. I'm 30 now, which makes me feel old as hell. But like, like we don't get invited into some of the same rooms. You be be the one holding the door open for the young people in your life. That's one of the best things that you can do as an older person. Next question, welcome. Yeah, Wilfred Welch. I would just want to continue on exactly those two comments. I feel strongly that the younger people must lead this activist revolution and the momentum. And I really want to go further as to what you all think as the role of the older generations in support of that. What does mm. that intergenerational collaboration and action look like? I, so I think 
it's standing next to the youth, so it's not necessarily standing behind them or in front of them, but it is, it's opening the door and being in solidarity, in solidarity and standing beside them, but letting them have the platform. Because they do need our support, they need us to open the doors, they need to have mentors and, and guidance, and they need to understand constitutional law, for example. They need representation, but but standing beside them and not putting them on a pedestal either. So youth are often now put on a pedestal of you are our hope and you are our solution. And that puts a huge burden on these young people because we it's all our problem too. And so just really standing beside them. Here, here. And just to follow up on that, because Greta uh, has said that, whoa, don't, you know, this idea that, like, youth will save us, like, no, that's, a, that you, that's passing the buck to us. That's a cop-out. You, sh you still have lots of power. You still have work to do. So that saying, youth will lead us, is seen by some of those youth as a dodge, mm -hmm. as a, yeah. <laughs> Next question. Hi. Um, I have to say that I want to offer a resource. Um, I am fortunate enough for the last 12 years, I've worked with the Global Issues Network as the director, and we work with youth in middle and high school around the world on five continents and give them the tools to really address and look at what they're passionate about and create local projects. And we're connecting kids around the world. And one of the first things we ask them to do is accept that they're global citizens. And that really is an important thing for them to do. And thus, they feel connected to everybody in the world. And they know they have an impact around the world. So I thank, thank you for you. tonight. But I just wanted to mention that as a resource, globalissuesnetwork.org. Thank you. thank you. We have time for one last question. Let's have our last question. Yeah, the last time we had this kind of an issue was during the 50s oh, on up. A couple of, all right, sorry, so go ahead. Yes, go uh, ahead. With nuclear annihilation and the Cold War. So I remember one group stood up and said, well, this is really an important issue, and we'll make this nuclear clock. And it showed how well or badly we were doing on the issue of blowing ourselves up by putting the clock close to the midnight or pulling it away. So is it time to create such a simple symbolic image of the, the, uh, the similar problem in that it could destroy the planet, you know, not in an instant, but over um, decades. And who, what organization would you recommend consider doing this to bring our focus on this issue? I think the Bolton of Atomic Scientists have done that. They are doing it. They but I would argue that the photos from Hurricane Maria I occupy the same role in our movement and the stories of the people who have been impacted by climate disaster are the best clock that we can create. Let's go to, uh, we have, I see some, we have, if we can get two more in quickly, then Lisa, the um, young person. Hi, I was curious uh, what role you think bipartisanship and compromise play in this issue. I guess how you would balance getting enough votes to pass legislation getting things done with also keeping in mind that we have a time limit with this issue. Because Ben Wessel, you know, the Feinstein video, she's basically saying it can't pass. I know what will pass. She doesn't want to back something that we'll lose. She's that pragmatic voice up against the idealistic voice. How about that? Uh, I would recommend that everyone get involved in the opportunity to flip the U.S. Senate and the White House to Democratic control. I think bipartisanship is awesome, looks great on a bumper sticker, and does not have a good track record of getting done uh, with, with problems that are existential to our fate. So I would recommend that we do our best to elect Democratic majority in the U.S. Senate, change the filibuster, win back the White House, and on day one, make the Green New Deal a priority. <laughs> But you know, in our system, Ben West, I'm going to challenge you on yep, that please. because if if the Green New Deal, any climate legislation has no Republican mm -hmm. votes, it will be like the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. and they will do their best when they get back in power mm -hmm. to kill it with a steely knife. And I'll remind you that the Affordable Care Act is still the law of the land. <laughs> okay. Last question. Hello, my name is Sally Morton, and this question is for Julia Olson. Thank you so much for all you've done. Um, I am an aspiring and young environmental lawyer, and 
I aspire to do the, excuse my language, the badass shit that you're doing. So do you have any um, suggestions for a young, you know, inspiring climate lawyer? Come work for us as a law clerk. <laughs> uh, I'd be happy to. And we, we actually, we take a lot of volunteer lawyers and law students, and there's a lot of opportunity to get involved. So hook up with an organization you care about and start doing the good work. I think that's the best advice. After we close out the radio program and podcast, please stay in your seats for a poem and another song from Monica. Then we invite you to join us in the lounge for a reception where we have these some placards out there for uh, Let's Talk Climate. You can take a photo of this and post it on Instagram and, or Snapchat or if you're old on Facebook. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to give a shout out to a couple of our Arctic adventurer scholars. Is, is Keon here? I think Keon's here. And, and Laura, if you can... Wait, are they? Yeah, Kian's right here. So Kian went to the Arctic. Uh, he won a Climate One scholarship. Every year we send one high school student from the Bay Area on a full ride to the Arctic to learn about climate. With, uh, and, and he went up there and had an amazing uh, experience. And the, the student who was going to go this year, I think Laura might be here. Laura? There's Laura, she's going this year. It's gonna be amazing. So for other high school students, we do this once a year, um, and they're part of the Climate One community. We send people out to, to learn about climate and make it part of their story. I get to sit up here and talk to these amazing people, but it's the Climate One crew that makes this happen. I'd like to thank Adam and Josh and Justin, Kelly, Lena, Sarah, Spencer, Steve, and Tyler. Let's give them a round for making this, this happen. And, We've been talking about youth activists pressing for a faster transition to a clean energy and an equitable economy based on the dire climate science that's been making headlines these days. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guests on this program were Isha Clark, a high school student and activist in Oakland, California. Sarah Goody, a 14-year-old student and climate striker. Also, Julie Olson, executive director of Our Children's Trust and chief legal counsel for 21 youth plaintiffs in Juliana versus the United States. <laughs> ben Wessel, youth vote director at Next Gen America. <laughs> and Marissa Zuckerman, Bay Area chapter coordinator for Sunrise Movement. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you podcast, subscribe, rate, review, then take your friend's phone and subscribe, rate, and review. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody. So we'll invite Ben and Julie and Marissa to take a seat in the audience. And what we'll our next very special guest, you're not done yet with the youth courage tonight. Um, I'd like to welcome Angelica Perkins to share a poem she wrote a few weeks ago. Hi, my name is Angelica. Um, closer, here? Okay, my name is Angelica. Um, the name of this piece is Yellow Sun. Okay. Some days, darkness pours over me like gasoline. It fills my lungs and stains my teeth. It squeezes at my throat when I try to speak and tears ignite flames all over my body. Rip away at my flesh, turn me into ashes. The rain washes me away. Some days though, it never comes to ease my pain. Instead, I lie on the concrete and body step all over me. I ease into the earth's cracks and make myself comfortable in the shadows, praying that bits of me won't get stuck to the bottom of anybody's shoes that no one will be able to see my burns, reminding myself that when the darkness fades, I can cough up the gasoline in my lungs and I will still be breathing. But what happens when a deep breath is no longer my safety blanket? One that isn't followed by coughing or cancer or death? And what happens when the gasoline in my lungs isn't just a metaphor for my teenage sadness? 
When the smoke in the air has painted my throat black, when making myself comfortable in the shadows means my people die to save a dollar. A dollar that has no value when there is no one left to spend it. A dollar that was made on the backs of black and brown skinned people and a fraction of that dollar they will return to us as we walk out of their coal mining factories with asthma and nervous system damage and a reduction in life expectancy and what happens when children are meant to be seen and not heard means I can hear my planet begging me for help and I ignore her means there is no more blue sky or yellow sun or butterflies and rainbows and I can no longer wake to the sound of birds chirping or walk barefoot down the beach or go to a park in which the green of grass and trees runs for miles. There is no telling what will happen when easing into the earth's cracks means waiting for someone to take inadequate action means watching the animals around me die because of man's hands, means continuing to turn a blind eye to racism and classism and homophobia because you cannot talk about one without talking about the other. And there is no telling what will happen if we allow our fear to paralyze us. Handing our lives to people who do not care about our communities or the changes we plan to make within them or the beautiful revolutions we plan to be a part of, we have to fight because I want to grow old to a blue sky and a yellow sun. And I want my children to be able to walk barefoot down the beach and my grandchildren to be able to run around a park in which the green of grass runs for miles. Now we'll close with a bilingual song that Monica Fimbres wrote, Nuevos Caminos. That was beautiful. Um, Greg asked me to share a bit about the inspiration of this song, and I'd say that poem actually really sums up a lot of what I was feeling when I was writing this. Um, it's The English part speaks a lot about the connection to the earth, and um, I think really just remembering how much we can, there's so much to think about and so much to do, and then there's so much to feel that is also just what reminds us about what we're doing. You know, when you go outside and you put your feet in the sand and you touch your feet in the soil and you play with your kids at the park and you reconnect with the earth, that's, that's the reason why we're doing this. And so this song is, is that visceral feeling you get when, you, when you're in the moist earth and you can feel it and smell it and connect to it. And that's where you find this passion um, to want to keep it going, to want to like, connect to your community and humanity and heal together. Um, and so the chorus, the Spanish, when it switches to Spanish, what it's saying is, forward I go because a warrior I am. And so I'm going to uh, quote Isha Clark before I sing and just remind us all that speaking our truth is respectful. Each 
power that comes from her Though I'm not asleep I see that this is our time It's time to rise We gotta open our eyes Palante me voy Porque guerrera yo soy Y hago nuevos caminos, nuevos caminos Y hago nuevos caminos, nuevos caminos But I'm not asleep Animales, vegetales, energía sincronizada, la mente humana vendada, tira al pozo a sus carnales, con los puntos cardinales, con los astros y el amor, por necesitar por favor, hagamos nuevos caminos, quiero la humedad del pino y el aroma de la flor, sabia, sangre, corazón, son de este mundo sustento, Empecemos desde adentro a hacer la revolución. It starts from within that we're gonna make the revolution. This is our time. It's time to rise. We gotta open our eyes. Palante me voy porque guerrera yo soy y hago nuevos caminos, nuevos caminos y hago nuevos caminos, nuevos caminos adelante me voy porque guerrera yo soy adelante me voy porque guerrera yo soy This is our time It's time to rise This is our time. It's time to rise. Y hago nuevos caminos, nuevos caminos. Y hago nuevos caminos, nuevos caminos. I see it coming. I'm wide awake and I am listening. Thank you. And that's called Nuevos Caminos, which is New Roads, which they are making. Thanks. Monica, why don't you stay up here? I want to invite uh, the, everyone who's been part of this program. I want to get a photo of these amazing people together. So including An Angelica. Come on up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Future leaders, currently, not future leaders, current leaders, right here. Okay. <laughs> 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 Please join us for a reception outside. Thanks, everyone.